All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Duncan and Griffin here. Uh, I'm super pumped about this. You guys are building a whole world that people don't know about yet. So thanks for coming to do this. Thanks so much for having us. Great to be here. Yeah, there's two of you. You both have to answer. <laughs> we sound we the same. All right. <laughs> let, let, let's just tackle the uh, the important part right out of the gate. You guys are identical twins? Yep. Yeah. People get this confused a lot. We definitely don't look as similar as Cameron and Tyler, but we are identical. <laughs> <laughs> Our parents promise. Yeah. Uh, I'm Duncan. I always wear glasses. Easy yeah. way to tell us apart. Yeah, yeah. Is that a twin rule that you have to each have a thing so that people can tell you apart? It, uh, helps, it helps a lot. I don't know. It makes yeah. a big difference. Are the glasses real? Yeah, yeah, they're real. All right. Do you have contacts? I don't have contacts, no. No? So just one of you can't see and one can? Well, basically what happened, like, when we were young, I would always stay up late into the night <laughs> reading books yeah, by that tiny little off. night light. Yeah, and, yeah. And Griffin just, like, I, was, like, I don't think he knew how to read. Yeah, just party. I didn't know he knew how to read. So I had a brother who, uh, the middle brother, which we used to always give a hard time to, he would, uh, at night, we have this, like, running joke in our family that my dad one time came to check on us, but, like, check to make sure we were all still in the house, except for my one brother he found reading Harry Potter under his covers with a flashlight. <laughs> 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 he was like, I'm not worried about him ever leaving, but the rest yeah, of you yeah, idiots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, that was Duncan. He was like, you know, the nerdy brother. <laughs> he had the flashlight. The smart yeah. brother. <laughs> um, all right. And then uh, you guys must get the question all the time. Your last name is Cock Foster. Yep. No yeah. hyphen. No hyphen. It's a, it's a very confusing last name. Yeah, like what happened in school? Where pe- did people think you were like joking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got that a lot. Uh, a lot of confusion. <laughs> Applying for jobs was tough. Um, a lot of people do think we're joking or, yeah. <laughs> or, or even they think that cock is our middle name and that we just love to say our middle name they're like wow these guys really love to talk about the fact that their middle name is cock but, <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened is our dad's last name is cock our mom's last name is foster and they just pushed them together but they didn't use a hyphen just yeah. gave us two last names yeah, so. we, we still don't know why do but, like is it like a, they had a sense of humor type thing because like, <laughs> like you know when you're in uh, high school and you're like sitting around with your friends and you're like man i'm gonna name my kid like jack ass right and, yeah. and, you're like, yeah. and then so yeah, maybe they're plotting and then after you hit like 13 you're like ah that's probably not a good idea right <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know i think uh let's hope I, not i like it yeah it, it, you know it's, it's memorable for, it's great for seo that's the thing like, yeah that yeah. is true not yeah. a lot of other cock fosters out there so yeah. almost none all right so you guys grew up in seattle yes yeah and lived there till what age 18 okay. lived there for 18 we both went to we went to separate colleges um i went to washington university in st louis I, okay. went to, I went to Emory. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then uh, after college, I worked at Jet.com out of Hoboken. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, well, I could talk a lot about Jet.com. <laughs> Mark Lore. <laughs> yeah, Mark people Lore. Don't, yeah. People don't know about Mark Lore and uh, diapers.com. Yeah, yeah. I know. It, it totally flies under the radar, but hell, great business, great place to work. But three, kind of, three billion dollar exit. Yeah, right? yeah, three and a half, three and a three half. Three and a half. Uh, the half like it, <laughs> if it's important. three and a half million, then people are like, ah, it's only half a million bucks. But when it's billions, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, a little bit bigger. And it's done well for Walmart stock price, like yeah. more than made up for that. Is he still running price. Walmart? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's still the CEO of Walmart.com. Um, he he's an animal, man. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Just it, what did really you do impressive. there? I was a category specialist. All right, what is that? So there, it's a job they're hiring for a bunch of people for, like right out of college. They put you in charge of a line of products. Okay. And the concept is, you know, you're responsible for the profit and loss. I, I liked it, you know, because it was like they pitched it as running your own business inside a bigger company. So it's not bad. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. But basically, after seven months, you don't like, sound super excited about it. <laughs> he well, hated it. Just want to say, called me and complained every day. <laughs> Why didn't you like it? I, I don't know, like not the company, but like what what about the role itself was like the, not as fun. The role itself, I just realized I was looking for a lot more autonomy. You know, at the okay. end of the day, that's fair. Yeah, and I thought there was much more green grass in starting your own company. I got I got into like reading Paul Graham essays, listening to how I built this. Just like started consuming a lot of startup literature, and I was like, this doesn't actually sound that hard. Like yeah. I, I bet you kind of become what you what you consume, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's true of you, food and information. Yeah, yeah, right. All right, so we have to address one thing. If you're watching the video and not listening at home, you guys, you guys make me feel like uh, you guys are giants right now. But actually, we just had to get new seats because uh, normally I only do one person. So they're sitting on these seats that make them look like they're literally six <laughs> twelve, which for those of you sitting at home is seven feet. Yeah. Um, but uh, all right, so you're at Jet.com, which becomes Walmart.com. Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? So I, did you graduate? I'll- I graduated. Okay, congratulations. I at, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, barely made it. Uh, I worked at Accenture as a software engineer, which- uh, That sounds fun. In, in the Bay Area. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, 
I also similarly was like, wow, I, I want much more autonomy and yeah. like want to do much more interesting work. And uh, and I got really into crypto basically right after college. And okay. It, Why? I mean, honestly, like always been interested in frontier technologies. Like that was the main reason. Mm -hmm. I was learning a lot about AI at the time. Mm -hmm. I was learning a lot about crypto. And uh, once I finally understood, you know, I, I had like a software engineering background. So once I, I like started implementing some stuff on Ethereum, that's when I really got hooked. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I, honestly, I think my experience was similar to a lot of people, which is like from a distance, it's, it's tough to understand. You're like, why is this so significant? But, but the closer you get, the like, the more you can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. And uh, that was really my experience with Ethereum and then with Nifty specifically, which like Got it. really and became so my area of focus. You're at Accenture at the time. You're like right. personally interested in crypto. You start playing around. Are you at that time interested in this stuff or is it more of like you talk to him a couple of times and he's like, hey, dude, you gotta yeah. go check this out. Yeah, it was much more like that. He talked to me a couple of times. He was like, you should really be paying attention to this, yeah. Nifty specifically. And I was pretty skeptical at first. You know, what product were you overseeing at Jet? I, I was in the sports fan shop at Jet. So that's like uh, sports memorabilia, like yeah. Seahawks jerseys, that, that kind of thing. Got it. Which is good. But I actually quit my job first. I was only at Jet for about seven months. Okay. And I thought I could, you know, I thought like startups, a lot of green grass, I should quit my job and pursue this. And I started an e-commerce company originally with a friend of mine from high school out here in New York City. Okay. And it didn't work, but I managed to pick up coding along the way. I didn't have any coding background. How long that. ago was this? How long ago? Oh, it must have been about it was two, 2017, right? Yeah, it was about two years ago. Oh, so okay, pretty recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so yeah. you taught yourself how to code while trying to build this. Exactly. Yeah, because I had to like code an app and like having something I had to like sit down and figure out. I had the designs. I was like, I need to figure out how to code this. That really made a big difference for me. And yeah, I mean, I should have. We we have been coding from a pretty young age, though. Like a lot of people in Seattle, you know, we we're doing it like age. Yeah, 12, I can't 13. imagine why anyone in Seattle would be into technology. <laughs> 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 you basically have to learn to code there. Like, yeah. Well, that, I think Bezos said that's why he moved to Seattle, right? Was he was like, I basically could just pick off all the engineers and people from yeah. Microsoft and build yeah. a business. Yeah, that was a big yeah. part of it. I also read that there was a law. You only had to pay sales tax if you're in, buying something from the same state you're in. So he didn't go to he didn't go to California. He went to Seattle because like Washington was a lot lower a lot, population. A lot less people buying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Got it's it. Good. It's boon for Seattle. Okay. And so uh, you've got an e-commerce company that ultimately doesn't work out, but you learn yeah. much along the way. You're at Accenture. You, after he quits, are you like, damn, should I quit? Or a, Yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was my idea originally. Yeah, a little bit. Well, so at this point, I was already I was already working on Nifty stuff. Okay. I was working on a company prior to Nifty Gateway, which was more just like an experimentation. And then after that, the what, what did that one do? So that company was called Gallery. Okay. And uh, honestly, like, to really demonstrate how like unfamiliar I was with the space. The whole point of gallery was like, okay, we're going to make nifties that only let you view a nifties image if you own the nifty, mm -hmm. which was like, in retrospect, such a misguided approach to take. Why? Um, because like the more you get into nifties, you realize like people just really don't care about that. People only really care about owning a nifty. They don't care about like having the exclusive right to view an image. Yeah. And they actually think it's kind of cool that if I own a nifty, I can post that image and like everyone can see it. And then they can go check out, hey, Duncan's the one who owns it. You know, it actually helps generate a lot of like nifty envy. It's kind of like if you're rich, you don't want anyone else to know you're rich. There's very few of those people, but people who are rich that want everyone to know they're rich, there's right. a lot of those people, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or like sports cars. It's like, why do you have the car? Well, yeah, if they're fun to drive, but really it's because you want to drive by people in the car. Same yeah, thing. Okay. Exactly. So this was like, I think that this was like a, a lot of people like seem to have this opinion and like it, it took me getting involved in nifties and like talking to other collectors before like i learned that that was just the complete wrong approach to take mm -hmm. and uh, so like that company didn't work out for obvious reasons because like our approach was fundamentally flawed but you know through that i talked to a lot of people in the nifty space like a lot of collectors and a lot of people making games and really i realized the user experience of accessing nifties was just like so overwhelming. The example I like to give at the time was a friend of mine was working on this project, Crypto Strikers, now defunct. Really nice looking project though. He made beautiful collectibles. He was trying to target like World Cup fans because okay. he was trying to replace Crypto Strikers, you know, with soccer player cards. Mm -hmm. But basically like anytime he would go pitch to any sort of like World Cup fan base, it was impossible to get them started just because the onboarding was so onerous. And you know, they're used to like, if they want to collect Panini cards, they just like hand over their credit card and buy a pack of cards. Yep. And so I was like, wow, this is 
you know, this this is pretty amazing what's happening. Like the collector base of people who love nifties is like so, so passionate, but you, we really can't bring it to a larger audience because the user experience is like pro- prohibitive. It's, it's truly holding us back. And, and would it be fair to say that it's almost like if you think of a marketplace standpoint, there's a bunch of people who want this stuff. There's actually a lot of people who um, are building them, designing them, building them, et cetera. But the connectivity, like the technology right. platforms that allowed those buyers and sellers to come together, that's where everything was falling apart before yeah. you guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the accessibility exactly. more right. than anything. There's just like so much friction. If you, if I want to buy something, like the amount of friction that is in place will like lead to reduced sales, right? And we're basically just seeing an extreme version of that where if the friction is so great that it's basically inaccessible. Like like the anecdote we always give, um, Adam Draper, our investor, he told us about when he tried to buy a crypto kitty, he says he spent four hours doing it and then he gave up because he was like, I literally, I just cannot figure this out at all. This is so confusing. So if yeah. that's the level of friction, you're never really gonna be able to get a mainstream use case and a mainstream like uh, yeah. product. Adam has uh, questionable fashion choices with his orange pants, <laughs> but we do know that he understands technology, so yeah. it's hard for him. Yeah, right? it's hard for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be exactly. hard for anyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. When he told us that, we were blown away. We were like, wow, yeah. really validates. Makes- so, yeah. so that was really the genesis of, of Nifty Gateway. Okay, so you're you're working on Gallery at the time, realize, hey, this model might not be the exact right model, but Nifty's in general are still interesting. You're working on the e-commerce company, yeah. kind of, hey, this isn't gonna work, but at least I know how to code. Yeah. And then at what point are you guys like, well, I guess like this person I pretty much spent my entire life with, maybe I should go build a company with them. Okay, yeah, that's actually a really good question because there's a good story here. Uh, so I moved to San Francisco. Did he kidnap you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be the best yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, like got to my head. That would be the best story, yeah. Maybe cause some tension. No, so, <laughs> so I'd moved to San Francisco and we were living together because I thought the Bay Area is a great place to be. Okay. We're still working on the e-commerce startup. We're actually living in bunk beds to save yeah, money. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, we're living in bunk beds. Like was, you guys slept on the same bed or one no, above the other? Bunk beds, one above the other. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually we tried the same bed at first. Well, in San Francisco, you never know. Like people could have bunk beds <laughs> and four people sleep in two and two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> could have shared bunk beds with two other people. Yeah. We weren't quite at the like rotational bed shift where like one person sleeps and then someone else comes <laughs> sleeps the next time. <laughs> but we were close, we were pretty close. But anyway, yeah, so I was in San Francisco and we were still working on different companies, but, um, we were just having a lot of strategy meetings. We noticed like we were working pretty well together. And then we went and saw a talk by Patrick Collison mm-hmm. that he gave at Y Combinator. And he was talking about the early days of him and John working together. And their approach was just like to compartmentalize responsibility, basically. Like Patrick would be in charge of one thing and John would be in charge of something separate. Cause like, you know, with co-founders in general, but especially with brothers, if you're both in charge of the same thing, it's probably gonna lead to a lot of conflict. Yeah. And we're like, you know, I think this could actually work. Like if we tried to take that approach for Nifty Gateway and really segmented it. It and so that's when you effective. decided you guys were going to start a company or you had already started? Duncan had already, he was already working on Nifty Gateway as a so, side project. Yeah. And I joined on board with him because I was like, I think there's a lot more green grass and crypto. Mm-hmm. And I started to come around to the idea of Nifties. It took a little while, but. Were you not convinced at first? I was definitely not convinced at first. Why? Well, I, I think. Like I think most people are not convinced. So yeah, like, yeah. What, like, what did you not believe in at first and what changed your mind? I thought the whole idea of a digital collectible like, sounded insane. It's. Definitely, I mean, it is to. insane. Yeah, it is insane. Yeah, it's a good idea, but it's an insane idea. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I still, when I tell a lot of people, like, it's one of those good ideas that sounds bad at first. But, so, yeah. all right, here's the big question: your uh, your parents, when you tell them, like, "Hey, we're working on not internet <laughs> magic money, but like internet collectible like magic," what do they say? Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. good question. I think our parents kind of gave up trying to control us a while ago. They're just like, <laughs> Duncan <laughs> and Griffin are going to do what they want. Like, you can't really stop them. So, I, right. one of my friends, like. Uh, he said, he was like, you know, Duncan, like in college, you were like into politics. Like you wrote for the school newspaper. You did all this like stuff. Like, so I thought you had a bright future. And now all you talk about is like these digital collectibles. Like what happened, man? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm going to show you. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, are, do you like message that person? Like, look at me now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rub it in the space. We, yeah. what, what, uh, what, what do we call it? Read receipts? Like you, you got to keep the read receipts, right? You're like, yeah, hey, listen, yeah. I, yeah. I know three years Track ago, that, you think yeah. I already forgot this, but just so you know, I screenshotted this. I put it on my hard drive yeah, at yeah. home and like, fuck you. Oh, we didn't forget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we didn't forget. <laughs> all right. So uh, your parents, are basically like just like stay alive basically like yeah, don't, yeah, don't exactly. screw this up yeah uh you start building this what convinced you that the collectibles went from like my brother's insane i don't know what he's doing to like oh wait maybe we should go do this together okay yeah the big light bulb that went on well yeah first of all the big light bulb that went on my head for like seeing nifties was when i saw like the community around it i mm-hmm. noticed like yeah. there actually were some like pretty passionate people and then i got into like 
seeing some of the projects and I was like, this is actually kind of cool. And I think my mindset just took some time to shift. It's right. like the idea of a digital collectible makes perfect sense once you, once you understand blockchain technology and everything. We really see it as a lot like Bitcoin in 2012, which is something we try to talk about a lot, mm -hmm. which is like from a distance, it's like, well, how is this different from PayPal? You know, like it doesn't seem that significant. But then when you get up close and you start to really examine the foundations of a lot of, you know, what exists out there already, you're kind of like, oh, well, this is actually like really impactful technology. And this does yeah. like matter a lot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I think I just needed some time to be exposed. And we've really seen that with a lot of our friends and right. other people, too, is like at first they're just confused. The advantages are counterintuitive, but the closer they get, they right. really seem to like have a positive. W what's the pitch? Like when you guys meet right. somebody now and they're like, what are you guys talking about? Like, what do you say to <laughs> right. like, hey, here's what this is. So yeah. I'm glad you asked, because after two years, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. finally we finally have a, a coherent pitch that like that seems to like break through with people. And we've two tried... years. You guys are quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, by the yeah. way, for anyone listening, if if you ever are trying to explain nifties to your friends, this is the pitch that we found makes the most sense. So like, it's what we recommend using if you want like a cheat code. But basically the pitch is like, uh, a nifty is a fundamentally better form of digital good. We've had digital goods for a while now, for like mm -hmm. 15, 20 years. And the most prominent example is probably a Fortnite skin. Mm -hmm. However, a Fortnite skin has some real limitations where it really only exists inside of Fortnite. If your account shuts down or Fortnite the game goes away, then your skin disappears forever. That's actually a pretty weird psychological experience for us. Because if I buy a pair of shoes and then Nike shuts down, it, it would be really strange for me to have those shoes disappear. A Nifty is the first type of digital good that exists eternally, can never be taken away from you. And uh, you actually you feel the same sense of ownership over that digital good as you would a pair of Nike shoes. And, and I think if I'm not mistaken, and take the video game example skins, if I'm playing the I don't know, 2019 version of Fortnite and the 2020 version comes out, I can't bring the skins from one game to the next, even though right. it's the same game. Is that right? Right. Or in some games, I think that's true. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's almost like a, a so digital. Like, and the reason I bring that is it's like, it's not like Fortnite's got to go away. It's also just like, hey, if you want to play the updated version, sometimes you can't even bring the skins with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You have no ownership. Like, a know? digital good right now, it's like if I were going paintballing and I get to the paintball arena and I rent a pair of pants, I can wear them while, like, during the paintball game. But then I have to leave them there after I, like, go home, you know, like, a nifty is like a, a pair of pants that I could buy in the score, store. I could wear them paintballing. I could wear them hanging out with friends. I could hang them up on my wall. It's like the first type of digital good that exists eternally and it exists outside of any one setting, uh, which I think really the larger picture is like that's letting us do things with digital goods that we haven't mm -hmm. been able to yeah. do before. Yeah, the whole really idea of digital goods before was like complete. It's a completely different conception, you know? Yeah, They're exactly. Like platform specific. You buy them. Like maybe it's like an upgrade in a video game or something. And that's like, how people think of digital goods is just like being cheap and like not really relevant. But See, like the, the way I've always thought about this is like the previous digital goods were just representations of physical goods in the digital world. So yeah. like, hey, do you want to buy this poster? Like here it is in the digital world, but like that's not actually a poster. It's just like a picture of a poster basically. Yeah. Now what you guys are saying is like, no, you can actually own the poster itself and take it wherever you want. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it can exist. Another like bull case for nifties is like the whole idea of like decentralized digital item infrastructure, like items you can buy that could exist in dozens or, you know, hundreds of different virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And will grow organically on its own. You know? And the physical world. I mean, like I have my nifties hanging up on world. my wall. Yeah. I yeah. can also show them off in crypto voxels. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I can show them off on niftygateway.com. There's like a, a ton of different places where I can like manifest that digital item. Mm -hmm. I just think the whole concept, at least for me at first, definitely the whole concept of a digital item like being valuable and being like platform, like separate from the platforms, counterintuitive. And that's something yeah. we see a lot with people. Where did the name Nifty come from? Is it from NFT? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's this like a, a lot of people started calling NFTs Nifties just okay. to make them sound like more approachable. This and was a totally pretty, jumped, on, jumped on that. Yeah, we jumped on, this is right when we started Nifty Gateway. This was a debate because the whole community was like, NFT sounds weird. We should start calling them Nifties. And uh, that was the time we were started Nifty Gateway. So we were like, okay, perfect. This seems like the future term people are going to use. So we called it Nifty Gateway. And I think we're now the, we're one of the best known companies with Nifty in our name. There's now nifties.com, which is like a, a media site. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where the term Nifty uh, comes from. Why did you put Gateway there? Because you want to be like the gateway to the Nifty yeah, world? The gateway exactly, to the world yeah. of Nifty. It's like you're a regular it's person. It's almost like you have like a pretty self-explanatory name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is good. I love self-explanatory like business names. Yeah, that's, me too. It's totally my jam. But like most of the time when people hear it, they're just like, 
nifty gateway like what <laughs> if they don't know what nifties are right exactly because they think we're N- nifty we're... kind of sounds like uh your the word your grandfather uses to try to sound cool sometimes right he's like ah that's nifty <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You're> like ah <laughs> it's true and there's a lot of different names for like erc 721 tokens like different platforms try to call them different things you know like if you called it erc 721 gateway people would be like what are, you, what are these nerds <laughs> yeah, yeah, talking uh, about <laughs> yeah exactly it wouldn't market itself quite as well yeah. <laughs> okay so how exactly does this work right so one of the things you guys are talking about is like the ability for me to own so let, let's just um use a, an example of a, a piece of artwork right um a, a paint like a digital painting i can own it and also i can prove it's one of one, one of five in the world, whatever it is. Walk me through kind of technologically how this actually works without losing everybody. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, basically the way it works is like, you'll what you'll own is the Nifty itself. Like you'll actually own like a, a blockchain token, mm-hmm. an ERC721. Then that Nifty- Private will, keys, the whole nine yards. Private keys, yep. the whole nine yards. That Nifty has like information stored in it. There's a variety of ways to store that information on chain, off chain. Um, but it has information in it called metadata that's like, mm-hmm. you know, it's there's a name connected, there's an image connected. And then to check the supply, I mean, that's that's smart contract dependent, but like on Nifty Gateway smart contracts that are going live today, you'll be able to check if you buy like a Nifty, you'll be able to ask the smart contract how many Nifties of this type exist. So you'll be able to verify that there's only one of one. Mm-hmm. So basically what the process is, the artist will take a work of digital art that they have They'll connect it to that Nifty, and then they'll sell the Nifty itself. And whoever buys the Nifty can, you know, prove with 100% certainty, like, okay, this Nifty was created by this artist. This image is attached to this Nifty. This name is attached to this Nifty. This like scarcity is attached to this Nifty. And then, like, that's how you. That's essentially what you're showing off. So would it be fair to say that this also not only gets into like digital ownership and your ability to, uh, I guess it'd be the mobility, or like to take it with you wherever you go, et cetera. But I'm assuming that this also solves all the problem with like fake art and right. knockoffs, yeah. inauthentic art, et cetera. That's the, that's the amazing part. I mean, like nifties cannot be inauthentic. I, I mean, I like, you could potentially make like a fake nifty, but it'd be exceptionally easy to prove that it's a fake nifty, you know, mm-hmm. like you'd have to be really, really unsophisticated to get fooled by a fake nifty. And like, you would never be able to fake the supply, you know, be able to check the smart contract mm-hmm. at all times. So yeah. like, and a, a nifty, like, as opposed to a physical work of art, it can never be destroyed. It can never fade away. Like, uh, you know, you can't even look at the Sistine Chapel now. I, Sistine Chapel, no, I think it's uh, Last Supper because, you know, so much sunlight has damaged the painting to the mm-hmm. point where- They cover it. Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, a nifty like you know it'll be rendered perfectly for the rest of eternity it'll always be able to like be viewed in its like form what was um was it banksy who like at the uh, christie auction house uh destroyed his own painting like yeah, yeah, somehow i have like yeah, a time yeah. sensor or something on it yeah what, yeah what yeah. was that story that was banksy i read about that yeah i think he just had a time like in the middle of an auction just like all of a sudden yeah. it just like broke and he activated it remotely and it shredded the original image. It really, oh, oh, it was remotely activated. Yeah, so they think that he was like there at it, the, or like maybe it wasn't there. Maybe it was like watching the live stream or, or like sent gave someone. somebody something yeah, or, or just like pressed a button, but it didn't work. It only shredded half of the image. And so now the artwork is like way more valuable. Yeah. It's right. Notorious. Like, <laughs> but, it, but is that what he tried to do was only half? I think I know, he, it's not clear, right? Like, no, I think they looked at it and they said, it looked like he tried to do all of it, but I don't know. I don't, he didn't have any more. competent engineers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just love the idea that something like that where they try to destroy it then it becomes even more valuable right yeah yeah because there's two there's like almost like a barbell right it's like hey if it's not messed up at all it's super valuable which is what you guys are talking about um and then on the other end is things like banksy or even like the last supper the fact that it is worn down almost makes it more valuable etc right yeah but there's no thing in the middle like no one's like oh man that art was really cool until you like smudged it (laughs) everyone's like no like that's just a screwed up piece of art that's not just smudged yeah yeah that's not cool at all yeah well i think yeah I, i love that banksy thing the art world loves stunts they love like yeah doing stuff like that. Can we they, talk about the banana? Yeah, the, the banana. banana. Yeah, the freaking banana. <laughs> Great example. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Like I, I was at Art Basel this year. And okay, I saw so the those that don't know, person. what was it? Somebody took a banana. They took a piece of duct tape. They duct taped it to the wall, it, and then they sold it for like a hundred thousand well, dollars. Yeah, under twenty, I think. Yeah, I guess it wasn't just like somebody. It was a very famous Italian artist. I'm blanking on his name, but he has okay. like he has an exceptional reputation. He's been making like 
you know, great legit art, art for legit a long art time. for thirty years, and, and then, then one day just had a break mental breakdown and said, "I'm going to go. <laughs> I have no more <laughs> ideas. Like I'm going to go put a banana on the wall." Hey, man, well, I mean, yeah. we're talking about it now. So. Yeah, we're talking about it now. I, mean, also, I think it's genius. Yeah, yeah, but then that leads us to like, didn't a guy go and eat it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did go and eat it. Yeah, yeah, someone ate it, but then they replaced it with another banana and duct tape because, as they said, the banana was just the idea. You know. Yeah. But, guy, like, okay, so that guy was not part of the whole scheme. The no, he was separate. Was, yeah, was yeah, not part of the. He whole was a scheme. performance artist doing a performance art piece of eating the banana but yeah the banana I mean like it, can we just say that that's ridiculous yeah <laughs> like it would be it like crazy. me just being like you know what I'm gonna start doing like uh, socially unacceptable things and just call performance art <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah right <laughs> like let's yeah, go exactly. to the Met and where they say don't touch things I'm just gonna start like touching Actually, them and just be like oh performance art, performance art yeah. <laughs> I feel like you could get away with a lot of that huh? yeah. <laughs> you can make a name for yourself yeah that's the not the is, name i want i, I think it kind of worked actually like i i bet that the, the banana is probably trading higher on the secondary market because like we're sitting here talking about it right now of course like the art world traffics in this kind of thing and yeah. it was also through like gallery paratine which is like a very very reputable gallery they show like daniel arsham they did show cause for a while they're like one of the so the, they're super legit too they're super legit so that's the whole that's like a big part of this is like this artist and this gallery have been doing this for like 30 years we couldn't just like walk in and like hang up a banana because they'd be like, well, who are you guys? Like, this is a big thing, a part of art that like didn't make sense to me at first, but now it makes sense. Where like your whole like life and your whole history of, of an, as an artist like feeds into every new work you mm -hmm. create. So it's like very much like it's not an overnight thing. It's like the banana in some ways has been in the making for like 30 plus years. So <laughs> let me ask this. That sounds ridiculous. But yeah, I, 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 get, I get your I point. Uh, let me ask this. You guys strike me much more as the entrepreneur, like technical side of this. Where is the interest in like the art side? Have you guys always been into art, liked art? Did you just say, hey, look, like what are the applications for this? How, how did that intersection happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we were into. Uh, we're, I only uh, do great questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. Uh, I, we were pretty into collectibles in high school. I was like a, an amateur sneaker collector. I think that really like. What was the best me. pair you had? The best pair I had was a uh, Jordan Sevens. I can I can send you a pic afterwards. It wasn't a great collection. I mean, I was a high schooler yeah, with, yeah. with not very much money. Um, I think my nifty collection is better. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then Jordans were like at least they felt like they were a way bigger deal when I was younger. Yeah, I like it, it feels like they've kind of they dropped off. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just I don't pay as much attention anymore. Yeah, I think yeah. it's like new fashion brands, like you know, off white, like this whole like Yeezy thing. There's a lot, yeah, of, Yeezy, a lot more Supreme. Like those yeah. to me feel like they have much more uh, attention. Maybe I'm just getting old and like the right. thing, the things that I read about, they're covering that stuff rather than covering like the kind of underculture of it's like Jordan, Jordan etc. Jordans are like Picasso and Warhol. They're like old art mm -hmm. and like Supreme and stuff. That's like. Like Banksy and stuff. street art. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, b because uh, I remember in middle school and high school, our big like contrarian thing, which really just meant that n nobody could convince their parents to buy Jordans, was uh, we all became Allen Iverson uh, sneaker fanatics. Oh. And so every pair he came out with, we'd make them our team shoe. Which only just meant like the kids all came together and like, hey, we should have a team shoe. And the parents would be like, what do you mean there's a team shoe? <laughs> they'd be like, well, we all selected this shoe. And they're like, so I have to go buy that? So, like, yeah, yeah, it's a team <laughs> shoe. I can't be the only one without it. And we'd all get a new pair of shoes every year. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant. We uh, should make team nifties. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. Um, and and now, like, uh, do you guys know about 100 Thieves? Yeah, yeah. yeah we like, they do super cool. They yeah. do kind of like uh, drops as well, right? Yeah, Where, yeah they do. Yeah. Uh, for um, all kinds of, like, merchandise and stuff? Totally. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think the esports market is, like, super interesting because you have all these teams that are kind of, like, you know, they're like commerce companies at the end of the day. But 100 Thieves is built like an incredible brand. Yeah. And it's built off the backs of, of being like, you know, one of the best esports teams in the world. And I kind of feel like that's the canary in the coal mine. Like that's something that's like small now and it's going to get like much, much bigger. Like it's definitely something to watch. Mm -hmm. I feel like they've totally distinguished themselves in terms of like branding. And I, I don't know. Yeah, they're really they're really cool project. I just yeah. saw that they have this new place in LA, and yeah, it's like, yeah. Jesus Christ, the Cash App Compound. Cash yeah, app compound. <laughs> yeah. So cool. it's so sick. Yeah, well, all this, yeah, all this Gen Z, like, there's so much esports culture stuff that, like, mm -hmm. I, I see it on a daily basis, and I'm like, wow, I, I feel old. You know, like, how old are you guys? Face Clan, 25. Oh Jesus! Christ. <laughs> I'm 31, and people tell me I'm young. I'm like, Man, <laughs> if I could go back to 25, yeah. and you guys live in New York. Yeah, 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 we, we live do. in Soho. 
Oh, real hard life. All right. 25 <laughs> in Soho. I'm sure that there's nothing fun to do for you guys. <laughs> um, all right. So you guys are building uh, Nifty Gateway. Um, the tech obviously works. How far do you get before you meet Cameron and Tyler uh, Winkleboss? Yeah, right. that's a great question, actually. Um, so we got the we got Nifty Gateway launched. And like you I went said, through Boost, right? We went yeah. through Boost, yeah. Right. So our whole we thing, should, yeah, we should give context about like, what happened after we moved in together and oh, decided okay. to join forces. So this, like, is, this is just still bunk beds though? Yeah, it's still, still bunk, bunk beds. beds. Yeah. Right. Bunk but like beds the, for a while. The first thing that we looked and we noticed like at, at that point you couldn't even buy nifties with a credit card mm -hmm. and we were like, okay, this is an, an extremely basic aspect. So we were like, all right, well, what if we made a, a platform where you could buy nifties with a credit card, which sounds like incredibly simple. There are actually some uh, tricky tech things we had to figure out on the back end. A lot of nifty contracts at the time were like hard coded to only accept Ethereum which mm -hmm. means we basically had to run a system that would purchase a nifty for Ethereum and then send it to a user like after we had purchased it. But it all happened automatically. So it was like a very smooth user So let experience. me get this straight is before nifty gateway, most people would have to take <clears throat> dollars, convert that to ether, then use that ether to buy the nifty and then they would receive the nifty in their wallet. Right, exactly. So obviously that requires the friction of, you have to understand ether, crypto, you have to know where to get it. Etc. Yeah, you guys exactly. basically just said, look, rather than ask the users to do this, just give us your credit card and then we'll like auto magically give you the nifty. But really what you were doing is that same process, but just you guys were just on the back end. Correct. Correct. Exactly. It. Yeah. So that was super the, smart. That was yeah. the first thing we did and we posted it with gods unchained. The way that the gods unchained was built, it basically allowed us to like gods on chain. Yeah. Gods, gods unchained. unchained. Oh, unchained, which is a, okay. one of the better known nifty games. I would say yeah, they're a really like cool a, company. They're out of Australia. Okay. Yeah, it's like Magic the Gathering, but all the cards are Got NFTs. It. Yeah. So it's okay. like a secondary marketplace, or it's like Hearthstone, you know? Yep. Hearthstone, yeah. yeah. So the, so the, basically the way that their game was set up, um, we were able to build the credit card purchasing product totally without their permission. So like we basically like put up a front end, niftygateway.com. We put up a website and we're like, it basically just said like, you can buy gods on chain packs with a credit card. And then we posted it on the Discord and everyone was like, wait, hold on a second. What is this? Like, who are these guys like scamming us <laughs> and trying to the, take our money? The first one we did looked like really, yeah. really jank. And, and everyone was like, like, why is this scam? website? Like, stay the fuck away. Like, I think someone was like, well, wait a second, guys. Like all the ICO scam websites like actually looked super professional. So like maybe it's a good sign that this website is so <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. such a bad sign in, in the long term, but in the short term makes so much sense. People are like, oh, it's a shitty website. Yeah, that's probably the legit one. Yeah, that's probably legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it works totally for exactly. Craigslist, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. I love so, like ugly websites that so, like get stuff done. I don't know. So one person on the Discord was like, all right, you know, fuck it, I'll try it. Like what's the worst that can happen? And so like they, they purchase, it works. And they get the pack, they post in the Discord. And then from then on, everyone in the Gods Unchained community is like, well, now there's this new tool where you can buy Nifties with a credit card. Like, And that solved a, a big problem for a lot of people. It was especially important when they're bringing a lot of new people into the game. Mm -hmm. Like, that's when we saw our highest activity on that. Um, you know, like, a, I don't know if you remember this whole like China Hearthstone issue that happened last year. There was basically like a flood of new interest in Hearthstone or in Gods Unchained. And at that point, we were getting like a ton of activity on the the Gods Unchained purchasing portal because like so many new people were entering the space. Got it. So like this was the easiest way to go buy, right? Yeah, to exactly. Get started buying Gods Unchained packs, you know, and to, for power users, people who like spent like tens of thousands of dollars on packs, like mm -hmm. it was much easier for them to do this. Did you guys play the game, or you just? I have it, a lot of cards. Uh, that's a no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's fine. Yeah. But but it's it's interesting because I mean this is the same way that PayPal grew, right? PayPal yeah. realized, hey, a bunch of people on eBay are using this. Like, totally. why don't we go find all the eBay sellers, right, and have them accept PayPal and make it easier and like use that community and that enthusiasm, make something easier, and then our business grows as well. Yeah, makes yeah. complete sense. No, totally, exactly. And that, but, yeah, that's how we saw it. Uh, but basically, we did that, and then we were like, th this got us like some minor traction, and mm -hmm. we were trying to raise money. It was like very difficult because everyone was like. Well, you guys are just two 23 year olds who like don't know anything about anything like and sleep is... in a bunk bed together <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah. Fine. eventually we got introduced to brayton the day before the boost boost tribe 12 was starting and we we told him like about the traction we'd gotten and he was like yeah like there's really not much in your guys background but like the fact that you've gotten traction is like impressive so like yeah we'll give you a spot in boost and like that was on one day's notice on one, one day's, day's yeah, notice yeah. that was basically applications have been it. closed for months and we're like wow yeah, all right but he was awesome. just like you guys are in and uh that was, that was pretty was cool. Was it worth it? Boost? Hey, Adam, close your ears. <laughs> was it worth it? Definitely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. What's the number one thing you got out of it? 
I mean, the, like any accelerator, I think it's the, like the community of other people you're around. Yeah. Um, and we, st we still know a lot of the other like boosties. Yeah, like we, the other, a lot of the other. Is that they call them. themselves boosties? boosties yeah. Right. Or cockroaches, like, and it's so it's such a crypto focused accelerator that like, uh, I think if you're a crypto team, like I would definitely like do boost as like the best accelerator. Yeah. No, definitely. Adam, Adam and Brayden, you guys owe us all um, some sort of commission when uh, people come, come, when all the applications come in. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> no, they, no, they're super legit. They actually they know what they're talking about, and I think what you guys are really kind of describing here is, is I, I think of it as an overlap between they understand how early stage startups and the challenges and kind of how to maneuver that stuff and test and, and try to find traction, product market fit, etc. Yeah. But they're also obviously super bullish on a lot of this frontier tech stuff, right? Crypto included. Totally. Um, and so they're a, a really nice fit in between those two things, right? Yeah, no, totally. And, and like for crypto, especially a lot of like mainstream VCs aren't paying as much attention or they're like really mercurial. They're paying right. a lot of attention in 2017. A lot of companies got crazy funding, but like Boost has been in Bitcoin and blockchain from the beginning. Yeah, and they're yeah. very like they're not tourists. They're not one of those VCs that was like, oh, easy money. Like, yeah, yeah. So, All right. So you go through the program. Then what happens? So we go through the program, and uh, at this point, our like we're still we've expanded the the purchasing product to like a lot of other nifty projects because uh I mean they all need it mm -hmm. and they don't really have a way to add credit card payments themselves. So okay. it's like an easy fit. But the thing that we quickly realized is like, it's really just not a very big market. Like there's not that many games out yeah. there. It wasn't growing super quickly. And we like, you know, we saw also sort of realized like if you're doing a startup, you don't want to be in a position where you're dependent on other companies growing for you to grow. That's mm -hmm. like a really yeah. difficult way. Like very few startups have pulled that off. I think Stripe did it well, um, maybe, but they're like oh. definitely the exception. And like everyone needs payment processing there. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that's kind of like, our view is like, I don't know if you know Elad Gill's framework, the like multiple miracle issue. Like you shouldn't require multiple miracles for right. your company to work is how we saw it. Like we just need like, it should be like, there needs to be one miracle for it to work. Like there should be one thing we have to de-risk. And for us, we realized we can make that one thing like, will people value digital art and digital collectibles? Will they value them the same way they value like real digital art or, you know, physical art and physical collectibles? Mm -hmm. And to us, like, that's a no brainer that they will eventually, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. But so basically we decided, we realized we had to pivot to right. a place where instead before, of like, before we were working with other nifty projects that already existed. And now we're like, what we need to do is find people who should be making NIF NFTs, who should be making digital art and digital collectibles. And we need to build a platform that lets them do that. And then lets mm -hmm. their audience buy it like really, really easily and access all of them. Like still focused on that accessibility, but also a focus on people, you know, who already have audiences, who are artists, that sell stuff for large amounts at Christie's or yeah. you know LeBron James, Supreme, like and, and realized have, they should be making nifties, basically. And that the nifties had to be like great. You mm -hmm. know, they had to be like very compelling nifties. Cause like I think like any other, I mean, like we we love to compare this new technology to like the to movies and like the video camera, where we're like, this is a new creative medium. Like you can do things in this medium that you can't do other places. But like movies wouldn't be a business if everyone only made terrible movies that were like unwatchable. Like people only like care about the movie technology because like the movies themselves are cool enough for people to like show up and pay money. The same thing is true of nifties. Like people only care about nifties if the nifties you're making are cool yeah. enough it's for someone to like, yeah, if, if the collectible is compelling enough for someone to like show up and hit buy and like, if they're like, or if it's a work of art that really speaks to them or like by an artist that really speaks to them, like it has to be good enough. Mm -hmm. Basically, like you can't, you can't defy the laws of, yeah. gravity so basically yeah and like i said basically before with the credit card purchasing product it was like we needed two miracles we needed first of all for a bunch of nft projects to like take off like a rocket in order to have enough volume to build a like solid business and then second we needed them to all use our product which right. would be a second miracle so we kind of realized like there's too much uncertainty here which is like how we pivoted and landed on the, you know nifty gateway in its current iteration yeah. which we kind of see as like the fulfillment of what we were trying to do initially, which is make NFTs accessible. Mm -hmm. Right. If and that makes sense. And such an important part of this, because like we, we always thought, we always like looking at the crypto space, like a lot of the applications that have the most traction are, you know, like Coinbase and Gemini, like they are centralized ways. Like people are really intimidated by custodying their own private keys and they're really intimidated by owning cryptocurrency. We always wanted to go with a, like a custodial solution that would allow our mom to like go buy a nifty, like trade a nifty. Mm -hmm. And, but we knew like, we, we like, we're very well aware of like how difficult that is to execute and how hard it is to like build a, a secure custodial yeah. application. So like when we met the Winklevoss twins and we started exploring a, 
um, acquisition, we were like, okay, this is a this is a piece of technology that we could not get on our own. We would spend like two, three years building it. We would have to hire like, you know, people who are like so incredible at this and like pro- we might not be able to convince them or we could go use Gemini's technology to build our vision. And like, we immediately have the best custody technology in the world, like backing our app. And uh, yeah, so that was- How'd really you guys fun. meet them? Yeah, we okay. met them through Adam. Yeah, that's another great Adam story. Adam Draper? Adam Draper, Draper yeah. Because we were joking with Adam. We are like, oh, right, identical twins working in crypto, you know, just like the Winklevosses, like, let's play that up. And he was like, well, I actually know the Winklevosses. Like, let me like intro you. And then, so we got intro to them through Adam. And then- Did, what, did he put like, twins, meet the twins? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know so, what he put. Yeah, I don't like think, that. yeah, something like that. I don't know if you saw the email, but they'd already had their eye on NFTs, basically. Okay. And right. they were already bullish on the technology. You know, they kind of saw it as like a, a large frontier. Mm-hmm. And I think they were looking to partner up with someone in the space to like build out their NFT efforts. So they were hunting and they you were guys hunting. were like, hey, we're uh, we're out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey. All right. And so first time you talked to them is on the phone or uh, in person? Right. So they didn't actually... When we first met them over email, they were like, okay, cool. They just passed us off to their like corp dev team. They're like, we don't even like, so they like, they handed us off to like a Gemini employee. They big dogged you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just call, we'll yeah. call one of this. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> they handed us off to one Gemini employee. We talked to, it was Sarah. Yeah, yeah Sarah. Sarah. Yeah, we talked to her first. No, um, no names. We're getting the eye. No names. No names. Okay. Go ahead. We talked to, <laughs> Just, just so everyone knows, everyone knows that I do this. There is a communications person in the room who is babysitting me, not them, but me. Go ahead. A little bit of us also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always me. So we, we, you we, guys are good. We met. We talked to mystery person X about what we were doing, and uh, and like we uh, we're, we're getting the whole head shake now. <laughs> we're now we're in trouble. All right, go ahead. Yeah. We, t- we talked to mystery person X about what we were doing, and I guess we we impressed her enough to like move on to the next person who is like the our current manager at okay. Gemini and like a, you know a brilliant technologist he, like he understood a lot about like what the the technical like pieces of what we we're doing like yep. why it was so innovative and he was like okay like these guys really understand the nifty market like very well um they like have the technological chops and they can build products that are very easy to use like we should escalate this to the week of us twins and then okay. we then they emailed us and like hey you should come like meet us in New York yeah and we're like all right well what could this be about but we're not gonna like Pass up on that opportunity. Yes. Yeah, so then we flew out to New York. And the first time. Did you fly private person. or public? <laughs> well, we lived public. in bunk beds. <laughs> yeah, we lived in bunk beds. Yeah. So yeah bunk we flew bed private. Thanks, you should tell Adam. Cameron and yeah. Tyler, like, hey, man, come on. You guys yeah. want me to come out there? Let's go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But then uh, we met them in person and they they also loved the product. They're like, this is amazingly easy to use. They're like, these guys like have understand our like our perspective on, like we share a lot of things and like the crypto custody is like, it makes this like a such an, a great opportunity because like that yeah. together like we would be able to accomplish things that we wouldn't be able to accomplish individually. All right, before we get to the business side, like what happens when twins meet twins? Are you guys just like <laughs> ah, what's up? You There's two a lot of like <laughs> secret stuff I can't talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Secret twin yeah, stuff. Yeah. I'm not really not like, at liberty to disclose. Cause, cause, yeah, because I figure it, it's like when I meet somebody who has a bunch of brothers. I got four brothers, right? So there's five boys all grew up in the oh, same wow. house. And if I meet somebody who had a similar life experience, I just know a whole bunch about their life because I just had a similar experience. Yeah. I'm assuming having an identical twin is pretty similar, right? It is, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it's probably similar. Like, do you think Cameron and Tyler ever slept on bunk beds? I, I doubt Probably. It. Maybe, yeah, probably. Maybe as kids. Maybe like as yeah, kids, yeah, as kids yeah. they probably Not did, as 23-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> we did as kids, too. Yeah, we definitely bonded over being twins. We were talking about how, like, working together as brothers was, like, really advantageous. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we hear you on that. Um, you guys ever get in fights? Like if I worked with my brother, we would be like best Definitely. friends, and then like I'd slap him upside the head sometimes, and he'd probably do the same to me. No, no, we never argue. No. <laughs> never. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's joking. Like, yeah, yeah. No, I think. Uh, but I you think can we, be honest with each other. Like yeah, I think exactly. that's the advantage, right? Is you don't no, have totally. to worry you can about really like speak your mind. It, and is it true? Like when I'm with my brothers, we could literally be one second perfectly fine. The next second, like people are like, "Oh my god, are they gonna fight?" And yeah, then, yeah, that's pretty, and then a minute accurate, later, yeah. people are just like, "Wait, they're back to like normal again." Yeah, and it's just you know, like that's my brother. We love yeah, each other. Like totally, we can always be honest with each other, figure it out, and move on. That's like exactly like our dynamic. Honestly, I think, yeah. yeah, I think the twin relationship, or at least ours, is like very similar to like being brothers, mm-hmm. except like the, your brother is like very similar to you, like looks very similar to you, like yeah, and like, like you have similar personality traits. We sort of like, yeah, it's it's kind of like, I actually, actually think it's great. Like, it makes my life easier. It's quite fun. Yeah, like yeah, when I moved to San fun. Francisco, I didn't know anyone, but like Griffin's friends from college were out there. 
like yeah. that, that's there's like glasses basically like, like Griffin yeah, glasses yeah, yeah. <laughs> just swap friends yeah, yeah. 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 Griffin with glasses yeah, 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 yeah. whatever yeah yeah, yeah. 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 no they thought I was Griffin the so do you guys have a group text chat with Cameron and Tyler that's like twins chat it's just the four of you in there yeah we actually do yeah we actually do and it's called twins chat that's called nifty twins nifty twins yeah it's a Slack channel yeah. We do a lot of nifty related stuff but no it, and twin yeah. communication it is interesting you said Twi- that though. The, all the twin secret communication the twin yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's well, where we talk about like the council of twins and like the, the secret the twin, twin plan to take over the world yeah yeah okay. you know now there's gonna be twins that are listening to this they're gonna be like hey we gotta get into there yeah <laughs> no it is it is if interesting you're a twin listening to this i suggest you start collecting nifties very often <laughs> support your fellow twins yeah support your fellow twins but like one time we we did go to stripe um and we talked to some of the employees there and he was saying that like he thought it was really helpful that the founders of stripe were brothers too because like like he said they can like push back on each other a lot more than normal co-founders would and that's definitely a dynamic that duncan and i have seen like you were talking about yeah. with your brothers it's the exact same like you can really really be completely honest which is super helpful in a business setting that's kind of like what you want you know, but you don't want to lose each other's trust. So, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of advantages to it. And honestly, a lot of successful companies have been founded by brothers yeah. or siblings. Like siblings, husband, wife. Like, yeah, it, yeah. It's always one of these things from the investor seat where you're like, okay, this goes one of two ways. Either this goes really, really well or this goes horribly wrong, <laughs> right? And it's such yeah. like a binary outcome because all of the advantages that you're talking about are also things that could like blow it up too, right? Because you're like, totally. man, I know that they're going to be honest with each other, yeah, yeah right? And yeah. can both of them handle thing, yeah. like actually, you know, having somebody be honest with them in a in a work setting. Yeah, so totally. when it works, it's awesome. And then other times, you know, yeah, awesome. yeah. It's I think for us too, it, it was so helpful. Like we were so much on the same page, like as to what we wanted to do with our lives. Like mm-hmm. right after college, like we were both like, all right, we want to do startups. It was kind of hard to find. Like a lot of our other friends were like. Like, look, I'm, I'm not that crazy. Like I have a you know good job career prospects. Like why would I give that all up to like risk it all and nothing? Whereas Griffin and I were like, you know, just like, fuck it. Like, yeah, we'd rather know. risk it all right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you probably still have, well, you're 25. You probably still have friends that are like, dude, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. like, hey man, we're in Soho. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <'cause> want a <laughs> nifty? <laughs> Check out my nifty plug. Like, yeah. <laughs> all right. So that brings me to uh, what was the moment like when Cameron Tyler were like, hey, uh, do you want to come here to Gemini? Did they just like, was it like a job offer on steroids or was it like, uh, we want to buy your company? Yeah, so it was, I, so we- did they the, DM you? Like, did did, the, was there just like a sli- slide in <laughs> yeah, your DMs? Yeah, yeah. Like, sup? <laughs> we did the meeting with them. Okay. And, uh, we, we felt like the meeting went very well after, and we were like, okay, like this it seems like there's a lot of synergies here. Like we're clearly on the same page about a, a lot of stuff. And the other thing we were considering was like obviously raising a seed round at this yeah, point. Yeah. And we we also thought that they would be great investors for that. And we were talking to some other like VCs. We were basically like that was our plan. But then mm-hmm. we we got on the plane, no Wi-Fi on the plane. We landed back in San Francisco and we had an email that was like, all right, guys, we want to s- start seriously exploring the acquisition path. And we were like, we were honestly a little uh, blown away because like, I mean, at that experience, we've been doing Nifty Gateway for like six seven months we we're still like in the, in the very early stages like mm-hmm. it was like getting off the ground and like i literally just quit my job like seven months ago like we were broke sleeping in a bunk bed it was kind of a surreal life experience. comes life comes real yeah, fast real huh? fast yeah, <laughs> yeah it's totally true yeah yeah i mean like it was really like a right place but right you now. had also built something that but, obviously people wanted right yeah. it worked yeah right they That's had true. done a lot of work before it's not like they just met you at a bar right exactly, they had already yeah. had a bunch of people on their team talk to you etc yeah and that was it was almost like you guys meeting them was kind of like the hey yes we bless this we like these people right yeah, we think yeah, they're exactly. smart etc yeah okay and then, so oh, go ahead yeah so then uh then we were like we talked it over with like adam and the boost vc team and basically decided that like that that was the path that we wanted to pursue and then we went down like the the m a process was it fun it is it's very stressful like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work it's a yeah. lot it's yeah. a lot of work and it's like it's just like complex and uh yeah, it's like it's yeah, all it's stuff high that, stress situation. It's all the stuff that's not fun but is necessary. Yeah, exactly. Right? It, yeah. yeah. Every acquisition is very similar. Um our parents right. are lawyers, which was like very helpful because our dad was sort of like the the point man and he like Was your dad your lawyer? He was he, he did or he was very helpful. He was, he was very, very helpful. helpful. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't the he wasn't the M and A lawyer. We had to hire like an M and A lawyer. Yep. He helped us like find the M and A lawyer. Got it. And he would help us he would basically like be there on all the calls to like make sure we understood what was going on. Yep. Like give us advice about stuff. Sort of like a mix between a dad and a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of these things. Um, I tell a lot of young founders, 
uh, your parents can be your greatest advisor or your worst enemy, depending on like if your dad, who's a lawyer, gives you help with legal stuff, like yeah. pretty good fit, right? Like that's what he does for a living. Definitely. You should probably listen. If your dad starts giving you advice on like, uh, hey, look at this piece of art I found, and like I think this is a good one, you're like, eh, uh, dad, yeah, appreciate yeah, the yeah. advice, dad, but yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, you've got on uh, Puma shoes and like, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. exactly get it. <laughs> yeah, like doesn't even use Facebook. Like he has yeah, an account, but he uses it like once every four months. So. He's like but, one of the least like technological people I know. Yeah. But understands law, right? So yeah, like, understands so the law. You, yeah, use yeah. use what you have at your disposal exactly. when you need yeah. it. Yeah. Um, all right, makes sense. Uh, so I'm not going to ask how much money Jim and I bought because uh, we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but if you want to just great. accidentally say it, that's fine. <laughs> um, you also in a public article, uh, part of the acquisition was in Bitcoin. Uh, that's, that's are you true. allowed to say whether you guys asked for that or that was part of the Twins offer? We, we chose. They, yeah, they, they chose. suggested and we were like, hell yeah. They, they asked cash for Bitcoin. Bullish on Bitcoin. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're major Bitcoin bulls. The, the only reason why I, I like that detail is because uh, I, I've tweeted this so I can say it. No one can get mad at me. Um, I actually think that Cameron and Tyler are going to go down as the greatest investors of our generation. Totally. Simply because they made a single bet that at the time was literally the dumbest thing in the world. Right, yeah, like yeah. Hey, let's go take millions of dollars by one percent of the Bitcoin network in two thousand thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, you I thought you were talking crazy. about Nifty Gateway. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. That, yeah. that, they, have, they, have two, yeah. they have two notches in their belt. Yeah. <laughs> but but just like the the conviction to see something yeah. early, right? right? And it's like one thing to be like, oh yeah, like this is cool. Uh, hey, I've got a couple million bucks. Like let me put a hundred thousand dollars and see what happens. It's a whole different thing to be like, no, I'm gonna put like a lot of my oh, net yeah. worth into something. Seriously, totally. And then also through all the volatility to hold on to it. Yeah. There right. is a, again, I'll say this, not you guys, uh, maybe a comparison of like, if nifties become what you guys think they will become, like they are one of the first to see that, right. And make right. a, uh, a bet in exactly. that space. Yeah. We I can't say substantial because we don't know. <laughs> I also That's think how we see like, Yeah, and, and going through the M and a process with them. Like we, we dealt with like so many, people in different contexts at that point. Like yeah. people we were trying to sell the product to, like investors. And like a defining feature of doing a startup is like basically everyone you talk to is like just very wishy washy and will say one thing and then like you text them an hour later and it's like it never even got like we had people be like, yes, we'll like we'll install the product, and then like three months later, we'd be like, so what? What? Uh, what uh, happened, yeah, guys? Not in twins chat. In the <laughs> twins yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah. Nifty twins. Nifty, <laughs> you're, you're, twins. nifty twins. Your your word is your bond. Yeah, huh? exactly. yeah. Well, Cameron and Tyler are just like they're so high integrity. Like they said, like yet yeah, from the minute that they said like we want to pursue this, like there was absolutely zero wavering, and they're also just high conviction. Like, right. Exactly. Yeah. The Bitcoin bet really demonstrates it. I don't really know where they got that from. Maybe you're just born like that, but like those two really do have like very strong conviction and yeah, like exactly. act on it. So, which is a very impressive, because like, rare, it's rare, it's rare, like you really don't see that. Like, a lot of VCs aren't like that. A lot of VCs are just like, oh, what's the hot company? Like, I'm just going to hop in there, you know? A lot yeah. of VCs, except for the best ones, obviously, but are, are very low conviction. But Cameron and Tyler are totally the opposite. So it's cool. Yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. Um, all right. Now you guys live in Soho. How's that? It's good. <laughs> it's good. That That's it. Just it's good. <laughs> You're 25 well, living in Soho. The, the reason why I bring up Soho is you guys have an apartment together. Yes. No bunk beds. No bunk beds. Se- separate rooms. <laughs> separate rooms. Wow, moving up in the world. All right. <laughs> but in your apartment, you have basically like a nifty gallery. Tell me about that. We have about we have like eight or eight or nine screens right now. Okay. All is that what it's called? Is that the the lingo would be screens? Yeah, well, they're just like TV screens. TV screens. Monitors, okay. The know, lingo right. is like still it's still new. I don't think we have a great like. Let's term just make it up. We'll just screens. say that we made it up right here. Yeah, nifty <laughs> screen. right, screens. Yeah. screens. Everyone yeah. listening, it's screens. Yeah. Go ahead. And really, I mean, really like. Like so much of what we do, like that's kind of like a a, a test case for us to like mm-hmm. develop like nifties and like we we find a lot of like a lot of the pitches we've been doing have been to more mainstream art people, like people mm-hmm. with track records in like the fine art world, like galleries, museums, etc. Like those kind of people, for them, like being able to visually see a nifty displayed is so so important. I think for a lot of like a lot of the early people who are into nifties. Um, you know, it, it's fine that they exist virtually and like, you know, they also exist in virtual worlds for a lot of more. We, we find like the more someone is like into the art world, the more that the visual display is like necessary to like mm-hmm. get them to understand what a nifty is and why it's so significant. So if I was in your apartment, basically the experience is I'm looking at these different screens and I can see a digital 
good, right? right. Yeah. And this could be like, give me the range of what that could entail today. So like, do, do we set up the gallery? It's a it's a full on show. I can send you the brief actually, but basically it's it's a walk through the history of NFTs. So we also treat it as an educational experience. The mm-hmm. first NFT that we have displayed is a crypto punk. Um, you know, rare Pepe's did precede crypto punks, and there were some like Bitcoin NFTs. But I think crypto punks were the first project that like really captured people's imagination, and that's the project that like defined a lot of the the elements that would like mm-hmm. become popular in the in nifty culture. Okay. So that's why we have crypto punks up there first. And also, I, I love the aesthetic of crypto punks, like the the fact that they're just like these pixelated. I mean, it's literally a twenty four by twenty four pixel image, which is a uh, I think very cool because it really makes it reminds me of like early internet culture and like mm-hmm. Sega, you know, like oh, Sega Genesis, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sonic exactly. the Hedgehog. Yeah. yeah. But then then it progresses through, and we have some other Nifties on display, and then we have some of the Nifties that we're going to start selling when Nifty Gateway two point launches. And mm-hmm. our illustration with that is like. You know, Nifty started off as like experiments. Like people didn't even they they had no idea if this was going to work or not. It was a counterintuitive idea, and now we're at the point where fine artists with track records are starting to recognize like the importance of this new medium yeah. and are really starting to take notice. And it's still only at the very beginning of that happening, but like we think it's a you know it's a new milestone for this technology and for this medium. So you guys are launching today. What? Yes. You made a big announcement this morning. Yeah. Right. So what we're launching today is. We call it Nifty Gateway 2.0, and there's two separate elements to it. The first is a centralized US dollar based Nifty exchange, which there's nothing out there that exists like that right now. What does that mean? So what that means is it's an exchange for NFTs that operates solely in US dollars, and it's all centralized. So it works the same way as Gemini does or Coinbase does, where we custody all the NFTs using Gemini's technology, Mm. and then users can buy and sell them with each other. So I can go on, I have no crypto. Yeah. I can simply go on with dollars and I can say, you know what? I like that third nifty on this screen. I want to buy that one. I pay in dollars. The dollars actually purchase it. I receive the NFT and the dollars go to the artist as well. Exactly. And then like when you're, when you want to sell it, you know, like that artist becomes way more popular. Their work becomes recognized. Like the value goes up 10 X. Uh, you put it up for sale on the nifty gateway marketplace. Uh, you receive credit. Like after someone purchases it, you receive like money into your Nifty Gateway balance, and then you cash it out directly to your U.S. bank account. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's only U.S. only. It's U.S. only cash outs, but like international expansion is like coming soon. And but, to, to sign up, you only need an email address and okay. like a username. You know, you, there's no KYC or right. anything like that. The larger point of this is like uh, basically it's the first Nifty experience that doesn't require cryptocurrency onboarding, and it's really the culmination of what we've been trying to accomplish for years, which is making Nifties as accessible as they should be. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, really that'll open up Nifties to a whole new group of people who like haven't been collecting Nifties before. And like, for example, you know, the fine artists we've signed up, their collector bases would have had a really tough time going through crypto onboarding to like Mm -hmm. get the full Nifty experience. Mm -hmm. Now they don't have to, they can just go through our very straightforward onboarding yeah. And so it's really. So if I go to niftygateway.com, I can go sign up and see all this? Yeah, yeah. you can see the collection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then that's the other thing that we're launching. Right, that, was, that was the first thing, was this US centralized aspect. exchange. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing, like I said, another big focus for us has been taking people who already have audiences and have followings in the, you know, the worlds of physical art or art celebrities or athletes or brands who we think should be making nifties, should be making digital memorabilia. And we're partnering with them and we're doing drops every three weeks where they release nifties. So we're also launching our first drop yeah. with three different people that we're really excited about. Who are the people? So the, the first one is Lila Werko. He's a photographer. He, he originally rose to fame as the guy who took the the photo of one of the Twin Towers on 9-11, and that was featured on the cover of Time Magazine. So okay. that was his, like, that's how he first like became famous. In 2005, he started working on something called the Boombox Project. And his art is all about, it's about like freedom, it's about youth, it's about expression. And he picked boomboxes because they're sort of this iconic technology mm-hmm. that defined like hip hop culture, defined youth culture in the eighties. And this is the gold boombox uh, part of the collection. <laughs> yeah, the gold boomboxes. So he started in two thousand five, just photographing a bunch of different boomboxes, and uh, the collection, you know, became quite popular. Like it's Beyonce and Jay Z own works from the boombox collection. Kanye West owns a work from the boombox collection. Of course he does. <laughs> yeah, of course <laughs> he does. Yeah. St- started off with just photographs, then he went to sculptures. And when we pitched him on the concept of nifties, he was like, okay, cool. I want to bring this boombox collection to a third medium nifties. 
So we're really excited about that because this is a guy who has, you know, a, a great collector base, like does shows in like some top galleries in like New York and LA. And he's now like, for the first time, like he's extremely enthusiastic. He loved the concept. He loved movies. the concept. Yeah. He's like, wow, this is the future. Like, I love this new medium. And he made the point that photography his the primary medium where he works. Like it started off as a, a joke of a medium in like the physical art world. And then people like started recognizing it more and more. He was like, mm-hmm. every new medium starts small. Mm-hmm. And like, he's he loves nifties. Yeah. He's bringing this collection that's had like such an impact on the world to a new medium. And like, we, we couldn't be more excited, frankly. So okay. that's, that's one artist. The second artist is uh, named Michael Kagan. He's an artist who, his work is all about the future and innovation. To me, like when I look at Michael Kagan's work, it's sort of like I'm watching the movie Interstellar because I get reminded of this like this America that was bold enough to like go to the moon, was bold enough to like explore space and Alleg- like allegedly, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> yeah. It was so he so he he paints a, like depictions of rockets, depictions mm-hmm. of astronauts, but like in a very serious, very kind of space innovation futuristic. Yeah, way. exactly. And so he's he's releasing five works. So we're we're calling them select works by Michael Kagan. Three of them are depictions of Apollo Eleven taking off. Oh, One of them cool. is called uh, Aldrin, and it's a painting of Buzz Aldrin on the moon. That's my favorite. And then the other one is called In Memory. That's also a depiction of an astronaut on the moon. I don't know if it's Buzz Aldrin or not, but he, I mean, he, um, another guy with an amazing reputation. Like he he just sold a work at Christie's for forty thousand dollars a few weeks ago. That that topped the high estimate. Christie's will provide estimates for all their art auction. Yep. His estimate was 25 to 35. He sold it for 40. And we like to talk about from Christie's to Nifty's, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we're getting, these are like fine. You have art. a tagline? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, well, these we're are, fine, it. yeah, these are fine artists who like have impeccable reputations in the fine art world and are collected by like, you know, some of the top collectors in the world. And they're starting to recognize this new medium for the first time, which is like an mm-hmm. awesome feeling for us. Yeah. All so right, that's yeah. two. Well, who's the third? The third is, uh, well, do you want to talk yeah, about? sure. Yeah, the third is Chris Cyborg. So this is not; she's not an artist. She's an MMA fighter. This is a which know, is a form of art. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I true. Love it. Yeah. yeah, and she's basically releasing a nifty collection. Um, the point of that is to provide a new form of like digital collectible merchandise, like memorabilia for her fan base. Mm-hmm. So she's releasing two different nifties. We worked with her to like connect her with a professional artist to illustrate them. The nifties look awesome. One of them is called uh, Cyborg Ready, and that's her like in black and white, like standing ready to like fight. And the second one is called Cyborg Victorious. It's much more colorful. It's her with her arms raised. And so these nifties serve for her fan base. This is a like, you know, memorabilia that they can collect, that they can engage with. I think if you're a fan of Chris Cyborg or if you're a fan of like crypto and nifties, this is like something that you can use to like further engage with her mm-hmm. work. This is basically like, you know, action figures, and that kind of thing, like moving on to the yeah. into the digital world yeah. for, the, for the first time. And yes. So, so we're, really, yeah, we're really excited about those three, and then we're doing them every three weeks. Right. We have a lot of great people lined up following. To, you know, it's really just like the beginning. Who's the craziest person that you've talked to about this, whether they actually agreed okay. or not? I don't know if we can. Yeah, I don't know if we. I don't know if we should say. But I, I can say. You can do we, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, we got more eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I will only say that. Um, it, it's remarkable, like the level of interest that we got from artists who were like, who have like absolutely enormous reputation. Like there are artists where we brought them in to have meetings mm-hmm. and uh, Gemini employees like came up and asked for us. They're like, yo, is that this artist? Like, can I, can I please art, meet him? Art, like art, uh, meaning like the actual visual, like painting or photography, et cetera, not like musicians? Not or... celebrities. Yeah. These yeah, are like, yeah. these yeah. are artists that are so like, so well known and so like influential. Um, well, a lot of people don't know, but uh, so I'm not as up to speed on like the art world. Uh, but if you take athletes, musicians, celebrities, etc., there's a ton of them that love digital assets in general, whether it's yeah, Bitcoin totally. or something else, totally. etc. Um, so it would only make sense that if you can find a way for um, people at that level of their craft uh, in the art world, and it can help their business. Like, yeah, right. Duh. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It, like I said, we've gotten a lot of interest. And then the cool part is how accessible it is for their fan base. Right. You know, if they're doing something blockchain related, my first thought is like, how tough is that going to be sign up for? Do I have to send in my like ID? But Nifty Gateway is like really, really yeah. easy to sign up for because we're only selling collectibles. So. Do you think that you guys will get brands as well? I think so. Yeah, I definitely think so. Like, yeah. could there be an, like Supreme and those types? I'm assuming this is like right up their alley, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, we, we've started conversations with a few brands and we're like really building it out. Um, we're we're going to make this an adventure. Like 
every every two to three weeks. <laughs> no, I fucking so, love you guys. <laughs> we're gonna make this an adventure. <laughs> Can't tell, ride, like, yeah. No, dude, we gotta make a business. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's an adventure. Nope, it's an adventure. <laughs> Buckle up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for us, it's all about like uh, you have one with the North Korean government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> it's nifty. We're yeah. really pumped for. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really think the the stuff that excites us the most though is like pushing creative boundaries with mm-hmm. nifties. The yeah. comparison that I love to make is like. What, uh, what if the video camera had never been invented? Mm-hmm. Did we talk about this already? I, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> like, yeah, like if the video camera had never been invented, Steven Spielberg never would have been able to make E.T. And like we would have been robbed of like such an important part of our like culture. You know, like think about the impact that movies have had on so many of our lives. Mm-hmm. Like we view Nifties as a very like a, a technology that will enable people to do creative things that they haven't been able to do before and to like impact our lives and society in ways that are like are really difficult to predict right now. So the things that we're most excited about are the people who want to use this technology to do things that haven't been done before to like really make an impact and to really make people think like whoa that that's cool like that's so creative like I can't believe someone like had that idea like I, How much yeah. do these go for? So like it, how much do you do so, you guys choose the prices? Do the artists? Has we them, work with them. We work with them to choose Got the it. So they, they basically are like, hey, here's the cool thing I want to do. Like, help me price this given where yeah. the industry is plus where like yeah. my other art sells. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah the, the prices vary. I mean, Lyle's collection, he, he's he's launching six, six different boom boxes, six different boom box nifties, and he's varying the edition number as well as the price. Mm-hmm. So like his gold boom boxes, there's only one of them. to one of a kind, and that's $2,500, mm-hmm. which actually for his work is like, it's quite a reasonable price. Pretty cheap, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he, uh, I think he was like super enthusiastic about this new medium, and he was like, "All right, I want to, like the market to figure this out. Like, I'm not going to be too too aggressive." Art, yeah. Artists like they um, they price themselves very differently. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of the, you know, like it could be kind of except for the banana thing. guy. The banana <laughs> guy <laughs> is he's got life figured out. No, but but it, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's like, hey, look, I want this to be successful it's almost like the success of it's more important than the price today because yeah. if it becomes a new medium you could see a lot of these artists moving you know i don't know 25 percent of their work into right. this medium totally. right I mean, yeah. maybe more who, well who knows? And they're, the, they're the pioneers like they're the first ones to like step up and recognize this this medium the first ones from the traditional art world i should say because mm-hmm. there is a, a like a vibrant community of crypto artists who like make awesome work you know um they wouldn't be able to exist without like the nifty medium mm-hmm. but we we view this more of like people who have like deep collector bases like more of a track record in the traditional art world like mm-hmm. are taking notice of nifties for the first time got it yeah what what scares you guys about this world like what what's like the big goal where you're like man if we could accomplish x that'd be fucking awesome well our mission is to get one billion people collecting nifties so yeah you yeah. do that oh I, come on is yeah. that possible <laughs> well maybe yeah. i mean maybe I, well, it's, it's certainly possible we're I mean, not gonna well, rest until it happens you're supposed to say hell yeah it is <laughs> hell yeah. So, i think well, people no. are actually like people like are surprised about the the like penetration of collectibles into mm-hmm. like our lives especially like when you think about like the term collectibles like it's kind of a really broad term. Yeah, yeah like, I call them knickknacks. Yeah, my, knick-knacks. Like, I, I'm gonna give Plain a hard time. She literally, uh, when we moved recently, oh, there was a whole box. I was like, "What the hell's in this box?" It's like a bunch of things. I don't even know. They're all like going on like, little cabinets. And I, was, I was like, "What is all that?" She's like, "They're, uh, you know, this elephant came from this place. This came from wherever." I was like, "What is this nonsense?" No knickknacks is the new rule of the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then somebody uh, was like, "No, those aren't knickknacks. They're collectibles." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. But yeah. Th- to your guys' point, literally those things fit into that category just as much as Jordan sneakers or a piece of artwork. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. The totally. only difference is like, you know, how, how cool they are, like how well made. And actually, this yeah, is- the like, elephants are not cool at all. That's yeah. why I was trying to, <laughs> I was like, hey man, get these out of here. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what I like. I've been doing a lot of research on like a lot of different physical collectibles. It's like, actually, it's quite hard to make like a very sharp, spiffy looking physical collectibles like the, the types of mediums that you can work with are kind of annoying like plastic mm-hmm. it's like you got to paint everything like precisely so many action figures are like not very done very well mm-hmm. i i honestly think like with the digital medium i mean you'll see like some of the projects that we have lined up you know we like hired professional illustrators but they honestly look like great yeah like you look at them and it's like it's totally true it's like wow like you you have an experience of like wow this is really really cool whereas mm-hmm. like a lot of physical items like the, the manufacturing quality really varies i think it's Basically, what I'm trying to say is like I think it actually might be easier to make a digital item that gives that like wow factor than a physical item. Of course, that, gives that wow factor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we see this sort of thing as inevitable. I think most people would agree with that. Like, just the question is when. Yeah, mm-hmm. the tough part for a lot of people is kind of like from a distance they don't really get it. When they get up closer, they right. start to think it's really cool. 
which is like what makes us so bullish on the concept because like those are kind of things you want to look for like the secrets yeah the, you secrets. Know, the stuff that the people who, who know about it are really passionate about and like right now there's a small group of nifty collectors who are really passionate about it and i also want to say if you want an adventure sign up for our mailing list new content every yeah. three weeks <laughs> we're gonna blow you guys away you're gonna open your inbox and you're gonna be like oh my god this is like i can't believe the creativity that these yeah. guys have Nif so like, See, like they, they think they're experts but at 25 they don't yet know saying sign up for the mailing list doesn't count unless you give the url so uh, you have to say niftygateway.com it's all right they, you, they, they, yeah. hey, yeah. we just got a thumbs up from the uh <laughs> yeah. fr from the babysitting so that we're good to go now <laughs> see how we buy ourselves some credibility at the end um <laughs> all right so where can people find you two on the internet uh Super active on Twitter. Twitter's my main jam. Yeah, Twitter. Again, same um, rule. You have to give your Twitter account or people can't find you. My, you're right. my name is Twitter. <laughs> DC Cock Foster. G Cock Foster. Just Google Griffin Cock Foster or Duncan Cock Foster. There's not a lot of other Cock would, Fosters out there. I, follow, can follow. we say that you guys are one of one? <laughs> I think we are. Right, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, one of one Cock Fosters. <laughs> follow Nifty Gateway on Instagram. Nifty underscore Gateway. That's yeah. like, you know, like. That's where you post a lot of the visual stuff. It's yeah. a visual. Nifty you know, Gateway on Twitter. Instagram yeah. is more visual than Twitter just by like by nature so like yeah that's why right. i post a lot of stuff you can't answer with the same answers to these questions what is the most important book either one of you have read do you want to go first Griffin? yeah i mean for me it's zero to one by peter Thiel, which i know is cliche for someone who works in tech but whatever i i love that book i read it once a year i don't know it totally changed Super the, way legit. I think about the world yeah yeah, yeah. It's the I, book I've, that he uh was it blake blake masters, blake masters yeah. yeah and then he has the notes online too from the original class which are also really good that like the book is made to be accessible but the notes like he goes into even more depth and yeah i don't know i i, I completely love that book like i said i read it once a year so i i like for me i'm really into reading like history and biographies um i think like El robert caro the lbj series was maybe like one of the most did you read that underneath your covers at <laughs> night as a teenager yeah, no, i was out partying i wish i wish all right so the L lbj series Right, so Robert Caro, um, he wrote this like he spent decade, uh, maybe forty five years now, writing this like wow. yeah, it's insane, writing this multi volume biography of LBJ. And the crazy part is, if Caro is he's in his eighties, he's a, uh, you know, like he's not finished with the series. LBJ isn't even president in his biography series, yeah, so yeah. he's written these books it's like twenty seven hundred pages in, and it hasn't gotten to LBJ's. Yeah, president. it just hasn't got to. But the thing I like about it is, is he gonna be is around to write about yeah, the presidency? He's trying to finish it. He's yeah, trying yeah. to finish. I don't, let's hope so. Yeah. But By, uh, by the way, uh, if you're writing a book, being that obsessed with somebody is cool. If you're pretty much doing anything else and you're that obsessed with somebody, like that's a crime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is weird. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good thing LBJ was dead when he started. But, yeah. All right. So are we believers in aliens or not? Um, no. 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 <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. Like, I haven't seen any you don't think there's out aliens there. out there i think it's possible i mean I, I would be most convinced by like the the math that there's just like so many planets out there right like there's yeah. got to be like like why Do you know how many planets there are you you want a crazy stat hit me there's ten thousand planets for every one grain of sand on earth yeah that's mind that's mind blowing like yeah fuck all of us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right and then on, on top of that uh there is now um scientifically they are quote unquote confirming whatever that means uh that a black hole burped which basically they get the black hole ingests so much energy by swallowing stars and all this kind of stuff that it quote unquote burped and it was the largest energy like transfer or event mm -hmm. ever recorded or ever uh measured in uh all of whatever and it happened like 360 million light years away or something wow. and like i basically it's like i have no clue what that actually means other than like dude the world outside of earth is massive yeah, yeah, yeah. it's massive yeah yeah it's so crazy it's just like incomprehensible but i don't know like maybe humans are just really special I mean, but I'm, I'm bullish that humans are going to become multi-planetary yeah i think like eventually we're just in your get... lifetime maybe i, I, really hope I so. mean like yeah. i think yeah. a moon colony sick. could happen in my i don't know about full interplanetary I think we're just going to get bored. Like, what else are we going to do? Like, you yeah. know, like we got to become an employee. Look, I, I love point. Elon, but uh, I saw today he tweeted, uh, occupy Mars, but it wasn't Mars. Uh, there's a planet, but it was actually the moon. And people were giving my heart, like, hey, dude, that's the moon. Like, yeah. you can't say <laughs> occupy Mars and then post a picture of the moon. <laughs> so we got, we got some work to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to know where we're pointing the rocket. Yeah, wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wrong place.
<clears throat> All right, you guys get ask me one question, then we're done. You guys can go back to uh, actually doing important things. Who's the most interesting person you interviewed and why? The most interesting person? I'll give you two answers. Uh, the most interesting person is actually re- talking about aliens. Uh, this guy, Bruce Fenton, came on. He is oh, an yeah. ancient alien researcher. Uh, long story short, 780,000 years ago, I think, there was uh, a massive impact uh, on Earth. And uh, there's a whole bunch of like, quote unquote, legitimate science that shows that this impact happened. There was like changes in atmosphere, blah, blah, whatever. Uh, most people think that it was a meteor that smashed into Earth. Um, uh, some people even think that it might have led to uh, the extinction of dinosaurs because it changed the pressure in the air, or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but Bruce walked me through all of that. And so I was bought in until he said, but it wasn't a meteor. It was a artificially, uh, artificial intelligence empowered, uh, extraterrestrial vehicle that, you know, got close to earth and broke up and smashed into earth. <laughs> <laughs> and he claims that then, uh, it got overlaid with a change in, uh, the human DNA around 780,000 years ago. So I said, Bruce, we're about 80% alive. The last 20% you kind of <laughs> yeah, lost yeah, me, <laughs> which is fascinating to like, yeah, you know, yeah. even if it's like pseudo fiction overlaid with like science, uh, scientific facts, uh, it's just cool to talk to people like that. Yeah, um, that's funny. And then uh, the, the most fun one, um, you want to know who actually uh, was fascinating to talk to given the time right now is uh, Kyle Bass. Um, so Kyle was uh, one of the people who shorted the housing crisis mm. and uh, ha- hearing him talk about like he was calling investors, screaming at them to put money into the fund because he needed more capital to short it more because he was so convinced it was going to happen. And he was like, people were like, oh, I'll get to it next week. And he was like, no, like, <laughs> go right now and put your mo- like sign the fucking document. Wow. And so when you hear that, you just like. That was a pretty chaotic period of the financial system. And yeah, yeah. like, damn, there's probably people doing that right now. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Right. So, That's so funny to think about. Kind, yeah. of, kind of interesting. Crazy time. Yeah, that is super interesting. All right. Cool. Well, niftygateway.com. Go buy stuff. Maybe I'll even like tweet out a couple that I like. But oh, then that means you guys all have to buy it so that everyone still thinks that uh, that I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be right. some really cool nifties. So. Thanks yeah. for doing this, guys. Hey, thanks for having yeah, us. Thanks, really Paul. Appreciate it.